can't do what they love doing. So I'm so grateful that they're willing to share their beautiful uh, photography with us. Uh, we'll be traveling Greece. We're gonna do a river cruise from Budapest to Amsterdam. And then we're gonna spend two weeks with the wild cats in Tanzania. So I'm particularly looking forward to that as this past summer, I was supposed to go to um, Africa with my family and obviously I didn't. So this is my trip and I love the price of this trip, uh, Larry. <laughs> it's free <laughs> compared to what I was going to have to pay. So um, thank you everyone. I wanna take this opportunity also to thank the friends. And I know we have Molly and Sue Kane um, on. I wanna thank you as, as friends board members for um, supporting us. And this program is being sponsored by the friends. And then um, I know Holly's thank gonna you. introduce Migs, but I also wanna to thank Migs for uh, taking time once again for helping out, out his uh, beloved Westport friends. And we all admire you. So thank you, Migs. And good luck, Bill and Larry. I'm, I'm uh, gonna sit back for an hour and a half and enjoy the show. So, so safe so travels. Real, thank real you. Real quick, a after the uh, presentation, Migs is uh, Burroughs, who's a local celebrity, is going to get on and ask us. Uh, some questions, but after that, we'll open up the floor. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah. I appreciate all of my friends from the uh, Wise Men, Mike Boyle, uh, Neil Goodkind, and uh, a few others, but uh, Bill Caldwell and uh, Sue Kane. Uh, I see more of you hopping on as the minutes go by. Uh, Larry and I are. Uh, uh, very uh, young in heart, uh, not so much in body, but uh, back in 2017, uh, we decided to, to heck with it. We're, we're gonna go off and uh, have some fun. Uh, so we decided our first trip would be to Greece. And Larry, uh, how many times had you been to Greece before? Four times. Four times. Each time it's been different. Always, it's always, it's always different. It gets, becomes more beautiful every time we go. Well, I, I will say that uh, you'll see some of that in, in the next minute or two when, when we share the screen. Uh, so why don't we just dip into it right now? Yep. Uh, in 2017, in May, we uh, traveled uh, to Athens uh, from uh, New York. Here we go. All this trip, this, uh, this uh, show, the three trips in three years. Okay. This is a map of uh, Greece, most of Greece, it's southern Greece anyway. Uh, we flew into Athens here. Can you, I uh, hope you can see my cursor uh, on the island of, uh, I mean, on, on the city of Athens. Uh, from there, we uh, took a, a drive, just Larry and me and a driver. That's the way we always travel, just the, just the three, two of us and a driver. And we came uh, this direction over the uh, Corinth Canal on, on down through Nafplio and out to the island of Idra, and then backtracking over here to Olympia, uh, through the mountain villages and around here to the East Coast. And, and uh, then we left the Peloponnesian Peninsula across that mo modern bridge, you'll see a photograph of it, over here to Delphi. It was a rainy day, so we didn't get to see the Oracle. I guess she was hunkered down. Yeah. And then we came back here through, uh, uh, the a, a peninsula up here and then back to Athens. Then we got on the plane and we flew to the first island uh, on, our, on our island portion of the cruise. Uh, this is the island of Mykonos. And then we went on through seven uh, islands in seven days, stepping at a, stopping at a different island on our 52 foot sailboat uh, and, and with two crew. Uh, and now why don't we head off to Athens? We were in the metropolitan uh, hotel and we were up on the top floor and took this picture, it was a nice introduction to Athens. The Parthenon with the Acropolis uh, was, was just beautiful, beautiful. It took your breath away. At night we saw the, uh, the uh, temple of Erechtheon, uh, the Caryatids, these were uh, pillars uh, showing uh, slave girls from that period. Uh, another view of the Erechtheon. 
You can, tell the, you can tell the weather was absolutely gorgeous. Yes, uh, Greece has very nice weather, and uh, especially in May. Uh, we caught these two guys uh, kibitzing down on the uh, uh, on the sidewalk, and this is very typical of, of Athens. Uh, they're drinking uh, typical Greek coffee that was brewed individually in these uh, little uh, Greek, they're called Greeks, Greekas. Uh, that both Tur Turkey and Greece uh, uh, make their coffee in these uh, little uh, copper and brass brickas. Uh, street scene in, in Athens, this is a way that they show their, their wares. I don't know how they reach way up. Uh, this is the parliament building and a guard. That was, that was part of our store that we saw before. All right, go ahead. And here's the changing of the guards in front of the parliament building. And this is the Corinth Canal, built, by, I believe, by Hungarian contractors. Uh, just how they managed to do it, I don't, I cannot imagine. You missed a couple of pictures. Uh, I didn't catch that. Uh, anyway, here, here's a, a very ancient, 400 years uh, before the current era, uh, this, this beautiful, huge, well-preserved, uh, Amphitheater was made. It's, a, it's called the Epidaurus Theater. You may be able to see the type, the captions on the upper left hand corner of your screen. A lot of concerts were played there and theater groups could come in. Very beautiful. And this is the uh, main drag in Afplio, the beautiful Bougainvillea. Which you see all over Spain, all over Greece at this time. Magnificent. And down here, this is a marble uh, street, actually. Uh, yeah. Just gorgeous, gorgeous. Uh, uh, everything is just fantastic. Then this is the island of Idra, H Y D R A. No cars, just horses and mules. And then up and down, down towards the end of a, a, another peninsula is the uh, Temple of Poseidon. And this was the late afternoon with the sun uh, bathing the temple with beautiful golden rays. We're off through the Peloponnesian Peninsula now to the mountain village of Vitina. Uh, as you can see, they like to be up near the top of the mountain. And I call this the town council. What they really were, I don't know, but they're kind of local. They're, they're the typical local. We went on to uh, the town of Olympia, which you all know from the Olymp Olympic Games that were originated here. Uh, this is a hotel, the Europa Hotel, which was magnificent. We didn't stay there, but we had dinner here uh, and watched the sun go down. This was our salad. Uh, this is typical Greek salad. You'll not find any leafy vegetables in a Greek salad. Uh, I've got a mess uh, you'll you'll find you. lots of cheese, lots of onions. Of well, you can tell for yourself. If you mean, you please don't, don't give you enough. touch. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even need to eat anything more after one of these salads. Wonderful meal. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, this is really quite incredible. This is called the Sea of Olives on the road to Delphi. Uh, on the Sea of Olives, there are a million two hundred and fifty thousand trees. Olive trees. This right is front, only, right in front of you. This is only about a third of the so-called Sea of Olives. And the uh, person who owns the uh, restaurant where we were uh, taking this picture from actually did own about a, a quarter of this uh, whole olive field, so he was not hurting. And this is a, some of those trees down at ground level. We then went across the uh, Anterior Bridge and left the peninsula. Yeah, it's just been completed. It was brand new. So this is uh, our flight up here, came in from Athens. And this is Mykonos Island. We then went on over here to Syros. Siphnos, Milos, Pologandros, Eos, and Santorini. Santorini is 
without a doubt, the most famous uh, resort in Greece. This is the uh, harbor in, in uh, Mykonos, where we landed, and the famous uh, windmills in Mykonos. This was the sailboat, 52-foot sailboat, uh, and our captain. Uh, these, are, these boats uh, go stern to the, do the uh, stone dock, and uh, you have to cross this uh, gangplank without any railings or anything and without, maintain your balance and get without out. falling in. Yeah, <laughs> really quite treacherous from our standpoint. Uh, this was the uh, salon in the, uh, in the boat, just the four of us on the boat. Uh, here's the shipyard in Syros. Our captain uh, tailing the halyard. Uh, this is a beautiful shot Larry made of a, sail, of a fishing boat, uh, just gorgeous colors and the sunlight is fantastic. Larry, I got to hand it to you. Good shot. I'll accept. Okay. Uh, and Larry took the wheel as we set sail for Sifnos the next day. Uh, here, yeah, that was my favorite uh, spot. And the island of Sifnos. Yeah. Uh, beautiful uh, lattice work up there. Uh, we're now in, uh, this is taken in Seafnos. Uh, this was early morning and uh, some woman is out there. Um, everything was kept immaculate and she's out there sweeping up what little there is. Uh, yeah. Clean. Everything on this was, was so clean. It was under, right, Larry? I mean, it was just- they cleaned, they cleaned everything. They watered everything down. Then they, then they, would, then they would sweep it. Yeah. It was absolutely perfect. And now uh, that, that evening we went to uh, the, uh, a, a big restaurant and there was a celebration from the lo local people. Oh, yeah. And uh, our, our captain brought along his bazooki and that the mate brought along his as well, and they were playing Greek ballads uh, after dinner. Uh, the people in that in that group that were having a celebration were dancing and singing and clapping their hands, and the owner of this place kept filling our glasses yeah. with free wine. Kept buying us drinks. Yeah. And then we set sail from uh, to, to, from the island of Sifnos to the island of Milos. I like this picture because it's a study in blue. The lines uh, to the boom were blue. Uh, this was not planned. The ocean blue and our attire blue. So it was just- yeah, But you'll, you'll notice that the boat is white and my hair is white too. And I think Bill's is also. So we have <laughs> some other colors in there. Yeah. And this was a, a, a really handsome fellow that uh, greeted us when we came into the Milos port. Now this is a very unusual uh, uh, lava, white lava beach in, uh, it's called Saracanico Beach in Milos. Uh, people have asked me, how can molten lava be white? Well, it had to be originally uh, white stone and it melted and formed white lava. And that's what we have here on, on the cliffs and the beaches of Milos. How many millions of years ago that was it? Yeah, a long time ago. Here we are backing into a uh, dock. All of the, all of the islands uh, you would go stern to to save space on their limited dock space. Uh, but uh, the captain maneuvered the boat expertly. It's not easy to sail, a, uh, to power a, a 52 foot sailboat uh, going stern to. Yeah, it's a very narrow channel. And they see the people, the staff up here waiting to catch the lines as we move back into it. And on this island called Polagandros uh, was a monastery. <clears throat> You'll notice that this is not a road, this is a stairwell. The only way the monks could get to their monastery was climbing up those stairs. Yeah. Uh, and then we went on to the island of Eos, 
And it is kind of interesting because there are five churches on this hill. There's three, four, and then five. They're very religious uh, in, in Spain, I mean Spain, in Greece. Another shot from, uh, from Eos, beautiful, beautiful blue uh, waters and, uh, and hidden beaches. Now we go to Santorini. We're taking this from the balcony of our uh, room in the hotel, which is built along, uh, on a very nearly vertical cliff. And you walk down, the, you enter the hotel and you start walking downstairs to get to your uh, apartment. And here's the uh, scene of many hotel, different hotels and their, uh, and their rooms coming down the cliff. This was ours here, if you can see my cursor. Uh, we entered up here on the upper left-hand part of the picture. And, up to the tower. And walked down stairwells to get to our room here, uh, which you'll see a couple more pictures of later. Uh, which had a patio out front. This was our patio uh, at our room. It had a nice jacuzzi, and uh, of course, it's nighttime, and you don't see anything but our uh, what the flash illuminated. And breakfast was served to us every morning. A wonderful breakfast. You put your order in and got you, got what you wanted every morning. Uh, and this is an iconic picture of the uh, blue uh, chapel domes in uh, the Oya uh, area of Santorini. Iris? O-I-A. Looking down here, uh, you'll see, again, this stairway is used by on foot and by uh, mules and horses. If you see, there's two little people right down there. That shows you the scale uh, right where my cursor is. Another shot. This is the harbor with an island out in the middle of it, and big cruise ships and uh, and very and huge private yachts uh, park right off of the beach and come in by uh, by dinghy. Uh, there are many shops in uh, in Athens, uh, and uh, some some shops just sell white outfits for women. Uh, <clears throat> At sundown, we headed off to this restaurant over here, and uh, the, the, the view and the setting sun was just breathtaking. And there it is, evening in Santorini. Larry is taking a break from his photography, uh, and uh, it was a, fare a farewell to Greece. So the following year, in 2000, um, in 2018, and again in May, uh, we took a Viking cruise uh, starting in the, uh, uh, in the Czech Republic, the capital of Prague. Uh, after three days in Prague, we moved down to Budapest and got on our, uh, our cruise ship and began sailing west to Amsterdam on the Danube and the Rhine. This is Prague. The, uh, uh, Tram is coming to a stop and the people are walking alongside waiting to go on board. And this is this, the main square in Prague, dominated by uh, the Church of Our Lady before Tin. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, square and just filled with tourists, but not too much so because it's so spread out, as you can see, it wasn't terribly crowded. It, yeah. This is the powder gate. This is the oldest synagogue in Europe and the only uh, one active in Prague. I never did quite figure out why there's this uh, ladder going up to a doorway right here. I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to step out of that doorway without... <laughs> anyway. Uh, there's the... Uh, Charles the Fourth Bridge, and it's not—it's close to traffic. It's just uh, uh, foot traffic, pedestrians, but beautiful uh, religious statues all along the bridge. 
And here we are on the bridge with uh, some of those statues visible. This happens to be me over here uh, with my blue cap on. Now we're in uh, Budapest. Budapest is the capital of Hungary. And this is the uh, Matthias Cathedral in Budapest. And this is what is called Fisherman's Bastion, just adjacent to the cathedral. This is the parliament building uh, for the Hungarian the country of Hungary uh, in daylight. Uh, and here it is at nighttime. Uh, our captain of our uh, cruise ship, very uh, um, uh, good, smart guy. He took the boat as long as it was. He took the boat upstream, turned around and came downstream because mm -hmm. all of the big buildings along the river were lit up like the parliament building. Just a, a phenomenal display. Magnificent, absolutely. Now we're on the Danube heading west uh, into Austria. Uh, this is the Hinterhaus Castle in, in the town of Spitz, Austria. And although they call it the Blue Danube, as you can see, it's green. And on board on the top deck, uh, Larry was playing chess. I don't know who, who is, uh, who he was playing with, but it was certainly a good sized board. <laughs> now we're entering Germany. Uh, this town has got to be one of the most beautiful German towns, untouched by the war. On the river, right, absolutely. Just, just magnificent. And where do you see the inside of the church? But the, Larry took this picture, it's, it's, it's we call it four green hats. Just magnificent. Well, this is the inside of uh, the St. Stephen's Cathedral in Passau. It's got more pipes in its organ than any other organ in the world. 17,974 pipes. And you only see a tiny fraction of them here. And the interior of this church is breathtaking with uh, all kinds of paintings on the ceiling and, and ornamental pillars, even a gold leaf pulpit down here. Every afternoon, they would have a concert with that huge organ and uh, regale the uh, tourists that would come every afternoon. And there's a, a path going down to the riverfront in town. This is interesting only because it, these show the depths that the river rose to in certain years of great flooding. The depth here is 12.89 meters, which is probably about getting between 36 and 40 feet above the level of the river itself, the Danube. So can you imagine the river got that high, reached that point in 2013, this was 50, 1954 in 2002 and 2011. So they do have uh, regular flooding of the river and they all know what to do and how to protect their belongings when the river starts to flood. And there's a Talc uh, River cruise boat, one of the competitors to the Viking cruise boats. Uh, this tower is a, I like the picture only because it shows where the freshmen had to, it, it, it associated with a, with a university and the freshmen had to go to, and without an elevator to the ninth floor. Obviously these seniors would be here on the first floor. This is the, we're in the town of Regensburg, Germany at the Cathedral of St. Peter. I took this picture because even in Europe, they have Antifa and you have the uh, hammer and sickle over here. Uh, and a beautiful, beautiful work of art here, this, uh, this Ferris wheel. 
Uh, in, in Germany, they don't call it Bavaria, they call it Bavaria. And this is what I call a Bavarian yawn. A sleeping one. <laughs> I like the, the congruence here between the old, the, 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 the lambs and the, and, the, and the shepherd dog down here with the new, the solar panels on the roof of the barn. The old meets new. This is the, uh, in Nuremberg, uh, this is the central square. It's kind of on a slope. Uh, maybe that's why all the tourists kind of slide down here to the front of this building. Back here is the home of their uh, most famous uh, son, uh, Albrecht Dürer, famous artist. This, this fellow is probably uh, a survivor of World War I. He has a pretty bad gash scar on his leg yeah and wearing his leader hosen this is albrecht Dürer's house now we're in the town of bamberg and this is their cathedral built in the year 1012 and a very interesting uh bow relief here uh, triptych uh, so you're talking about a thousand fifteen years old. And we're all familiar with the name Mesher Schmidt. They had more than one business going in that family. Now this is the town of Berthheim. Uh, Berthheim uh, beautiful. Many of these towns were not uh, bombed during the war because they there was no reason to waste bombs on non-industrial, non-manufacturing uh, towns. Fortunately for Verithyme, uh, all these beautiful buildings were left unscathed. And this is, I took this picture because it shows you an interesting thing that occurred years ago. Uh, initially, when these buildings were being built, they were being taxed on the per square foot of their footprint on the ground. The higher stories, they added, I'm going to turn it down. Right and finally, oops. Back off. And finally, they get a little top heavy, so they changed the law. They're, I think they were afraid if they went any higher, the buildings would tip over. Now we're uh, on the way to Koblenz uh, with the sun shining on this uh, interesting bridge. Passing a barge, lots of barge traffics, of course, on these rivers, uh, and they are uh, narrow and long, but the, the locks they go through are capable of handling them. Uh, I hesitate to name, pronounce this, Rokoskapel near Bingen. Just, just, just liked it for its, just for its beauty. And the Ehrenfels Castle built in 1215 on a very steep hillside. And the vineyards in Osmanshauser, Hollenburg. I'm not German, so I don't pronounce very well. And they're mostly on the side of mountains, as you'll notice. Yes, uh, I might add that the vineyards could only be planted on one side of the river. That's the side that got the most sunshine. Uh, here we have uh, Berg Reinstein, uh, probably the oldest castle or fortress. They use both terms, fortress and castle. The fortress because they were uh, utilized as lookout points. They could look from a high vantage point. They could look up and down the river to see if the enemy was sailing down the river. Uh, towards them on a, uh, and, and they would get a chance to, to tell the people in town uh, to beware. This one, although it's uh, 1118 years old, it is still being used here at this level here, you can see there's a restaurant. And some of these also have uh, uh, apartments that you can stay in. And th there's the same, uh, castle showing above the town. And here's the Berg 
cat above Hausen, Germany. St. Silas Church in the town of Bopard, built in 1150. This was the uh, Marxburg in Braubach. Uh, it, it was built in 1117 AD. Uh, I would say this was the only one we were allowed to go up and, and, and investigate in, inside the fortress. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I included it. This happens to be their, their toilet. Uh, and you can see how thick the walls are uh, from where I was standing to that uh, window in the back. Uh, that's the thickness of the wall at that level of the fortress. Uh, whatever went down that, uh, that under that lid would be outside of the wall. And now we're in Cologne. The Cologne Cathedral was never bombed but the rest of the town was obliterated completely and burned by the Allied bombers. The word has it that they didn't bomb this church, not because they, uh, were, they were compassionate or religious, or just being very, uh, very nice. No, they used it as a turning point. And even in a, 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 a moonless night, this church was capable of being seen by the, the navigators of the bombers. And when they reached over uh, Cologne, they knew that they had to take a turn to the north to go up to the Ruhr and uh, where the industrial area that they were set out to bomb uh, was situated. So they left this church unscathed. And there's the back of the church and here's a picture of it in 1945. You can see the buildings around it, just shells. Nothing remained of anything except for that cathedral. We're now in the Netherlands, and this is the uh, Kinderdijk Kinder windmills. Dijk is like our dikes. The, these windmills were not built to, to uh, grind grain. They were built to lift water if they uh, were and they had to lift the water out and put it at a higher level or all of this would be flooded i have the date here of 1740 on this windmill relatively young well that was it for the river cruise and now we're on to the safari to tanzania the ngorongoro crater and uh, the Serengeti. This crater is absolutely immense. It's now called, it, it is now a caldera. A caldera is a volcanic uh, hole, if you will, that, where the rim folds in and fills up the center of the volcano. There's a thin layer of, uh, of Soil and uh, around inside the rim of the of the crater, and I'll go into that more later. But those those rims are uh, uh, two thousand feet in height above the uh, bottom of the crater. Here's an idea of its height. That's a whole herd of buffalo down there that looks like little fleas, but uh, they're, they're pretty far away. This was on a drive to go to the bottom of the, of the um, crater. Yeah, uh, you had to check in and fill out a form to be allowed to go into the crater, in fact, to go into any of these uh, national parks because of poaching. Uh, they, they've done a great job of merely eliminating the poaching by using rangers in, in fast moving uh, cru land cruisers. You had to be signed out also. Yeah, if you, they knew by computer, if you had signed in and at sun, and sunset, sunset, if you had not signed out, they would send the rangers in and get you. And you can see the huge uh, uh, side rim climbing up here and the buffalo enjoying the, the beauty of this crater is that it, it didn't dry out. The rest of the area, the Serengeti and so forth, in the summertime would dry out and they, uh, the animals had to migrate up into Kenya following where the uh, green grass still was abundant. 
But in the Angola Angola crater, uh, you found that year year round uh, green grass, so they didn't have to migrate. Here, this baboon is getting treat, treated from two sides, a nitpicker and a, a nursing baby. Now, the local tribesmen in the uh, area here in Tanzania are Maasai. This fellow is quite yeah. tall and he's carrying a weapon, which is somewhat the, the same as in Kenya. They go back, back and forth. The, the, the Maasai people used to live in the crater and, and in the Serengeti, but the country decided to make them tourist attractions and told the Maasai that they had to move out. So they now have their hut, huts in their village uh, outside in, in, a, in a conservation area. A uh, very handsome little warthog, uh, black-backed jackal. And the roads are very rough. They're unpaved and they're really kind of tough on the tire. So we only had to change tire once on this trip. Or not, not we, but our guide, a Maasai named Emmanuel. Well, you should note that the vehicle just held the two of us and the driver. So we had the vehicle and the driver throughout the whole trip at the time we were in Africa. Yeah, and it was really nice for photography so that uh, you didn't have people uh, blocking your way when you had to quickly move from one side of the uh, uh, vantage point to the other side in order to capture a photograph. But these hippos, I can't imagine hippos having any better place. They, they are in Shangri-La, let me tell you. We really love this. Yeah. And there, I'm on the left, that's Larry in the, behind me. And uh, obviously we're enjoying our trip immensely. Uh, I had the hat of our, uh, our uh, company that uh, ran this trip called African Dream Safaris. These are wildebeest. And they, they like to play and tussle. Here we have a white egret and up here, and these are sacred ibis. A lion with uh, his harem of at least four females. I think the females did almost all the work of hunting and they the lions kind of waited there. <clears throat> Wait for the kill. Very patriarchal. Now this is out in the Lake Manyara National Park, not inside of the crater. Very interesting looking stork here. And here's a pic two pictures of an elephant here gathering uh, some greenery and filling his mouth. Now this is the only uh, rhinos, rhinoceros that we came across. We thought we would never get one because in the entire country of Tanzania, there are only 31 rhinos left from poachers. Uh, this picture was taken one half mile away from this beast. Yeah, 400 millimeters. I, I had a 600 millimeter lens on Larry and uh, uh, and then I still cropped in even further. But this, this, that's why this picture is a little fuzzy because he's a half a mile away. A gray crowned crane, just a beautiful, beautiful bird. Saw several, many of them. And this is the less colorful Cory bustard. And of course, uh, the, uh, the ostrich. This is a male. The females are a, a kind of a dull gray. Uh, this is a baboon. I don't know because of its age or what, but it was a much lighter color than the rest of the baboons. And it, uh, baboons in great numbers are called troop. This is a troop of baboons. You see this a lot. In fact, they're the most numerous animal, um, even more numerous, I believe, than the wildebeest. There are about 
a million and a half wildebeest in Tanzania, uh, 750,000 zebras, uh, and 31 rhinoceros. Here we have a hyena who's just uh, ripped the leg off of a wildebeest. Let, that's Larry inside of one of our uh, lodges. This is in a coffee farm, uh, not far from the uh, crater. And now we're heading towards the Serengeti and passing some of the locals. These young men rent these motor, motorcycles in order to run a business of, of uh, taxiing one person at a time. Uh, and that's the way they made their living. Of course, the guy that really made off was the guy who was leasing the, uh, leasing the motorcycles to them. A lot of poverty in, in these, uh, the, the locals live in poverty, really. No cars, they walk miles and miles to get to their schools or their shopping areas. Now we're gonna enter the Serengeti National Park. Uh, these are impalas. In this country, we call them impalas, uh, but the Maasai call them impala. Our first sighting of a leopard shortly after, in fact, within a few hundred yards of entering the uh, Serengeti, we see our first leopard. And they're not that easy to see in the daytime because they, like most cat, big cats, they, they do, they're hunting mostly after dark. Gorgeous animal, except for this one. <laughs> this is an unusual dark-skinned warthog. Now this is the acacia tree. Obviously it's a dead, it's a beautiful- uh, uh, It's a work of art. Work of art, uh, and, and probably going to become a fossil, but I might mention that the only tree that can grow in the Serengeti are acacia trees. Uh, and the reason is that their uh, roots are uh, surface roots. They, they don't need to go down deep. Uh, that's about the only other, uh, there are, uh, all the other trees cannot live here because a few inches under the soil is the hard lava. So the roots just can't go down very far. We have some thirsty giraffes. Uh, hippos have to have water. They must have water to keep cool. And they only get out of the water to find the grass for their meals. Now, we were lucky on, on this a portion of the uh, trip. Uh, somebody canceled out that had uh, paid for this uh, enormous uh, two or three bedroom lodge. Yeah. So we got it for no increase in cost. As you can see, it's pretty, pretty fancy. Now, the, uh, the, 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 all of these deer-like uh, animals in the Serengeti are a family of antelope, from the smallest dick dick to the largest eland, and they there's a wide variety of uh, antelopes. These are water bucks. Now here we have zebras coalescing uh, in preparation for the great migration up into Kenya. They gather here for weeks and then in huge numbers and eventually they get going. We got there, we thought we would actually see the migration underway, but since the weather had been wet, the grass was still green, as you can see, and they were in no hurry to get going, but they were aware that they would be getting going. So they meet and uh, gather over several weeks before they actually leave. Yeah, you know, they'll gather here over a million animals. It'll be, okay. a, just, it'll be a total mass of animals by the time they leave. Here's just three, three zebras, thirsty. Now this acacia tree, if you look closely, has something interesting in it right here. That's a lion asleep in the tree. And then I think he was a little upset with us, waking him up. Uh, Larry, hey, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> Do you remember her name? 
No, but it's a female lion. Uh, anyway, this is the M the Embalaghetti Lodge. And there and we stayed at this place for a couple of nights. This is interesting because we see, we see uh, hyenas actually um, stalking zebras. They'll be going after the youngest. If they find the younger, the better, the easier to get. And a pair of giraffes. And a buffalo in the grass. This is a termite hill, probably well over 100 years old. Lots of elephants, both in the Ingorgo crater as well as the Serengeti. These are three young cheetahs at a watering hole. They're probably about two years of age, much older than that, and they'll break up and go their own ways. They're, I think they're, they're all up from one uh, litter of, of cubs. Here's a bull elephant, the leader of a uh, whole troop of elephants, herd of elephants, going to a large acacia tree in order to have shade in the hot afternoon. His whole troop will come in under that tree and sit out the rest of the afternoon in shade. These are reed bucks, another part of the antelope tribe. Interesting, their horns are all different shapes. And I found this fossil, uh, excuse me, Larry, uh, this picture to be interesting. Uh, this, this is a picture of our uh, land cruiser, and you can see how we stand up inside on our seats, right on the seat itself, and we can pop up here under the uh, sunshade and take photographs 360 degrees. Uh, this was one of the more beautiful uh, shots of a, just a gorgeous antelope. And I call this one among many. Most of these are wildebeests, but the zebras and the wildebeests um, have no problem. Like they they live, live and migrate together. Uh, it's a marabou stork and flamingos. So this is an old bull, not, not terribly old actually, but the bull, the male bulls fight for supremacy and the, one, the losers have to leave the herd and go find their own, their own female and build their own herd. If or, you will. or they go off to die as a matter of fact. This one may be old enough to go off to die. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right, Larry. Um, you, have, you have a female lion stretching. This is the late afternoon. They'll be, she'll be going out for the hunt when the sun is down. This is one of her babies. Very cute and very inquisitive. And I think she's tired before she's even working. You can see the curvature of the earth here. Uh, this Serengeti means the great land. And it is great. It is just enormous, hundreds and hundreds of square miles. I love this picture of the giraffe. Uh, the, the eyelashes here are mesmerizing. There are eight giraffes in this photograph. The smallest one over here appears to be nursing. Now, Larry, you want to say something about these flamingos? Where I don't see them as yet. Oh, well, normally you see thousands of them. This is ra rather rare. You see so few, and they are taking off now, and they'll take off as a group. But they are magnificent when they when they fly. Absolutely exquisite. Um, now, when you have a, a lot of flamingos, 
They're called a stand of okay. tornadoes. And the reason they took flight like this, just as we arrived, was because the driver in our uh, land cruiser had a tape recorder of a lion's roar. And he played it with the purpose of giving us an opportunity to take a picture of them taking off. And they took off as soon as they heard that lion roar. You know, we're, we're waiting for the takeoff shot. I preferred this shot rather than an, an, an in-flight shot. It's very rare. Right. They're almost like walking on water here. Yeah, yeah exactly. This is the smallest of the antelope family, the dick dick. Uh, it's the color such that you can, the camouflage effect is, is fantastic. You could walk right next to them and not even see them. Yeah, right. In the Serengeti, you're not allowed to make any permanent uh, abodes. So they built a platform and there is a removable tent on top of it. But uh, I don't think they take them down um, very right. often. Not, not, they don't have to. That, this is where we stayed at, uh, one night. Uh, this is a mother cheetah with two of her cubs. And they're the two cups are really cute. And this is a, le a leopard coming down uh, and then looking us squarely in the eye. Um, very suspicious looking, but anyway, beautiful. He was uh, with his mate, uh, found a safe tree to be in in order to mate. And they, then he did mate. They spend a great deal of time in trees because that's much safer for them to be in a tree. And also they can see the, where to go uh, when they start, when they go for the hunts. They'll also drag their prey into the trees to, as a safeguard from stealing. Mm -hmm. This is one of our uh, overnight stays. Uh, <clears throat> you might not believe it, but these uh, tented villages have running water, plumbing, uh, showers, uh, all uh, portable and uh, provided. You tell them when you want to take a shower and they make sure that they have the hot water ready. And they give you 40 gallons uh, and, and you think that you're just back home taking a hot shower. Now that, that's a pretty senior bull. Those, those uh, tusks are among the larger ones. Here are the, uh, the, the elephants trying to get some shade, but they picked a tree that doesn't give much. Still, I guess it gives them some. Another shot of an impala. It's just beautiful, beautiful uh, antelopes. The lion with his uh, harem and, and two cubs. And here's a full pride of lions. One male, about four females, about eight or nine little ones, all in the shade of one tree. And this fellow has got his belly full of a zebra. Amen. Somebody that was up where I live and saw this picture, didn't realize the zebra was dead and said, oh, isn't that nice? They're sitting down together, but unfortunately not. And the baby uh, zebra has a kind of a reddish uh, fur that will gradually shed as it goes up. And that's a Maasai driver. Emmanuel, he could spot a lion or cheetah where we would look in the same place and we couldn't see anything. They, they grow up in that place, you learn how to track. The birds on the uh, giraffes are pretty good buddies with the giraffes. They help take the parasites off. 
And I said, this is why giraffes prefer to eat from trees. He was a young Maasai boy. Uh, most of the Maasai are not this well dressed. They, they wrap themselves in uh, blankets, uh, usually patterned blankets, and, uh, and carry usually a, a, <clears throat> a large stick for herding their cattle. Or a spear. Uh, yeah. Or a spear. That, the Maasai do not ever eat wild game. They're sacred to them. They have domestic herds of cattle, and that's where they get their food. They would starve before they would shoot or kill uh, wild game. Just why and how long that's been the case, I don't know. And here's the, you can see the wildebeest are just masses and masses of them. You're beginning to get an idea with this picture. As far as the eye can see, wildebeests. And this is just a small part. Uh, if I had taken a panoramic shot, you would have seen left and right uh, many hundreds of thousands more. Among them are some buffalo. These are the old uh, leaders, I guess, with those white whiskers, and they used to be called news, GNU, news, but they're really wildebeests. These are Thompson gazelles, beautiful, probably the fastest non-cheetah, non-cat uh, animal in existence. Only a cheetah could take down a running Thompson gazelle. And here we are at sunset on the Serengeti. This secretary bird is the only bird that catches its prey while on the ground. There were three brothers, uh, male lions uh, in this group and they would remain together only until they got us to a certain age. Then they would battle it out like the elephants do and, uh, and, and like other uh, animals do for the one that would win and stay and the other two would have to go off and find their own, find their own females. But these two brothers were friends. It may not look that way, but they are. Now they're nose to nose. And one's a little discouraged. More impala. Now this is one of the tented camps. This is the dining area. There's another area a little smaller than this for uh, the kitchen and another area for uh, uh, just like a, a large uh, central area for uh, with couches and we ate over here in this table and they serve us from a serving table back here. The shot of a typical shot of a of an adult hyena. Now here we're starting a story that was quite surprising to us, but we took a series of shots of this cheetah family, the mother, and I think there were five or six uh, cubs, uh, ranging up to two years of age, <clears throat> and here they're just all staying on the alert because of the youngsters, they have to be aware of hyenas and other predators. Now they begin to notice that something's going on, something's out there. So they're getting quite nervous. One's even turning around, looking the other direction. Uh, now they have spotted the hyena that's out in the, out in the grass. Mother, According to the guide, the mother has trained her cubs on command to go the other direction and hide in the grass. 
and you can see them turning around and following her directions. There's the hyena. There's the mother spotting the uh, hyena. She will not go after the hyena. She simply wants to scare him away because she can't leave her babies. And, and with, with this visage, I think any hyena would get the hell out of there. And there are the babies hiding. And lo and behold, a couple of them came up on our vehicle thinking it was some sort of a big termite hill, I guess. And they were completely bamboozled. They looked down on us and uh, wondered what in the world is going on inside of this big termite hill. And one came forward, Larry took the shot. The next one. <laughs> and this, this guy got very close to uh, Larry's lens, maybe eight, nine inches away. Approximately, yeah. I think he was more scared than I was. <laughs> but whatever, I guess, I don't know, something bothered him. Well, he finally backed off. And this is the one looking at me. He just couldn't figure out what kind of an animal I was. So he gave up and lay down and yawned. Well, according to the driver, it was very, very rare that these animals would jump up on a vehicle like this. So the driver was very surprised. I think he too was a bit scared as what as to what was going to happen. So we just kept shooting. We, I didn't know we didn't pay much attention to what, what what was going on elsewhere. We just kept shooting and shooting, and we got some marvelous pictures of, yeah. of these animals. Uh, he said that the only time a cheetah or I would jump on, they would jump on the hood and be separated by the windshield. This was the first time, as Larry said, that they, he ever saw them come into the back and they could easily have jumped right down uh, onto the seats next to us. If they yeah. Another one of the uh, trucks in our group uh, came up behind and uh, were shooting our animals on our, our uh, land cruiser. Uh, it kind of puzzled them. This guy's kind of wondering what to do about it. So they decided to take action and they started to get off of our uh, boat. We, these pictures were taken by the people in the truck behind us, uh, showing one of the guys already down on the spare tire and the other guy waking up. And here they're both leaving our truck and off they go. And there's our truck and over here, you see the mother and her babies all safe, all sound and heading away. And that is the end of our three rewarding trips. Thank you all for coming and watching. Wow, that was fabulous. Thank you. So I'm Holly Betts. I'm the program manager here at the Westport Center for Senior Activities. Thank you all for coming. And now we have Minx Burroughs. Um, he's a native of Westport and graphic artist, and he is a member of the Westport Arts Advisory Committee, the Levitt Pavilion for the Performing Arts, and a founding member of the Westport Artist Collective. And Minx is going to do some Q&A for us. So I'll turn it over to Minx. Oh, thanks, Holly. And, and thanks, Larry and Bill. I, the only place I've been that you were showed here was Tanzania, so I can attest to how how beautifully you captured uh, the wildlife and the scenery. Yeah, really I was going to ask you if you had been there. I thought you had. That's the only place. I mean, I haven't been to Greece. Or... This was the seventh, seventh time I'd been in, in Africa, and it was probably the most exciting. Uh, I'd been on numerous other trips with other people and with my family and other and yeah. friends, but this was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. We must have shot thousands of pictures and it's just um which is typical by the way oh sure to get now i, I like to ask photographers they don't always have an answer because it varies but uh do either of you what's the best shot either of you never got you know either because of timing the camera was too far away you you know the lens cap was on and you missed what but in your mind i know i've asked larry silver this and he 
he has it's from 40 years ago he remembers he, he can paint a picture of, of this yeah. shot that he missed well, let me tell you all megs uh, years ago and i i did i taught some uh, photography and the young people would come with their cameras and show me their cameras and i'd always tell them take the take the cap put it in your pocket and don't ever take it out again <laughs> but sure as hell you're gonna you're gonna lose a good picture yeah <laughs> Uh, one picture I, I wish I could have had the chance to take yeah. as I know those rhinos do have young young uh, book young rhinos uh, at that time of the year but if I'd been able to catch a picture of a rhino with a baby rhino I would have yeah. been very happy mm. um, for me uh, I, I, I didn't get it got done in Australia I got a shot of the flamingos, thousands upon thousands of them, just taking off from the lakes, and it was just a massive pink. I didn't, I didn't see that here, but that's the picture I missed a long time ago. Okay. Extraordinary. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. As many as you take, there's always the one that gets away. That's right. Um, I'm wondering how you approached, you know, the two of you together. Uh, are you competitive, not in terms of like the best shot, but like if Larry's taking a picture of a bull elephant. Bill, do you just look for something else to take, or will you, you? It's okay. You both take the same shots. I mean, how do you? We're very competitive, so we we do take the pictures of the same thing. No. And then later, when we're uh, editing and selecting pictures, uh, we'll sit together and uh, argue it out and, and choose which one gets uh, published and which one doesn't. And I oh. always win. I always win. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, you're the oldest. Not quite. <laughs> yes. But it's great, great fun to edit afterwards. I mean, it's just, you, there's so much you haven't seen here today that, that, that would blow your mind. Um, and, you know, it's in our heads. Sure. But, you know, it's um, just, just remarkable. And you get to relive, even seeing your shots of Tanzania, we, you actually stayed in some of the lodges I stayed in, and I just yes. brought back the memories of what was around there and the sights and sounds and smells of everything. Um, so the the other I was going to ask, could each of you describe if if it's describable uh, the other's approach? Like Bill, how would you describe Larry's approach to photography, and then Larry well, get his it, turn? It's most, it's most obvious, I believe, in Greece. Uh, the difference between our approaches, Larry's more much more of the uh, artist than I am. I'm more the technician. Uh, Larry will take shots that uh, I probably wouldn't. Uh, realize would turn out to be interesting shots. And, and he'll put his camera on burst speed and he'll take maybe a dozen uh, shots of one thing. And sure enough, out will come a, a magnificent shot. Even if all it is, is a, uh, a, a lily on a white wall and the shadow of the lily, along with the diagonal of the, uh, of the wall will turn out to be an, a, a real work of art. Uh, I wouldn't think of that. I, I, I would more back away and take a picture of the building to which mm -hmm. the wall uh, was attached. So I'm more of a technician. I like to work uh, with post-processing on the computer uh, and see how I can make the pictures better. Uh, and, I, and, and Larry, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, two eyes. Uh, <laughs> the key, uh, makes, I mean, you know this as well as the, the rest of us. You've got to look around all the time you cannot look just straight ahead you've got to look at everything no matter what it is and you know say to yourself now is that a shot or is it a shot if you think it might be a shot you shoot it if all that can happen is you throw it away or you leave it on, on the cutting room floor um i've been shooting pictures since i was a child i still have a uh, a kodak camera that my father gave me when i was about six years old um takes 127 six or six or eight shots i still have that camera wait i don't think i've used it but uh i used my camera for many years in business i was in advertising public relations and i always had a camera with me wherever i went and if, if i if i had a crew of people working for me uh, particularly uh for annual reports and such and i didn't like what the photographers were doing that i already had hired i very often do uh, shoot myself and see that they got into the books. But uh, again, it was, it's always a matter of your eye. You've got to always say to yourself, I've got to keep looking. 
when when my wife was alive, I used to drive, do all the driving or most of it. She'd always say, say to me, "Look at the car. Look at the road ahead. Stop looking <laughs> left and right." And so always said, "How else will I get a picture if I don't look left and right?" So we had that little discussion for years. But you really have to continually look around you. Now at home now, since I can't go out very much, I've discovered lately that uh, there are a lot of pictures in the house, or that uh, I've taken that I take that I never noticed as a possibility before. Mm. Um, art art pictures, very interesting. It gives you a, a whole different look on life, particularly if you've been shooting photography outdoors or models or portraits and so forth all around the world, which I have. But in your own home, you could probably build a program just as we did today. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so how would you well, sort of, uh, you know, uh, taking off on that, you know, tourists, there aren't so many now, but, you know, when they when they see the Eiffel Tower, the pyramids, the Parthenon, the Taj Mahal, things have been photographed 8 million times. What, how, what would be your advice to if if they if they care to take a more interesting picture of that uh, that place. Well, I mean, what do you do? How do you make it different? How do you guys make it different? I, the key there, I mean, because this occurred a few years ago when I traveled with the the diamonds to, to the last trip, my last trip to Paris. I, Ted and I went up the uh, Eiffel Tower, and I, that question came to my mind. So what I did primarily was shoot from the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower, in the Eiffel Tower, with people, close-ups of people's faces looking out or looking at something mm. relative to the Eiffel Tower. So there was always something beside the Eiffel Tower that everybody else would pick up uh, as a postcard. And the fact that people are moving around, or you get just their face, or you get them pointing or at, 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 with a pair of binoculars, and you, you, get, you, you get the depth of feel from the Eiffel Tower and what they're shooting and what you what what you were looking for. Always, again, look for something out of the ordinary. I'd also add, uh, Larry, you like to take pictures of people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And whether, uh, I mean, you took a whole lot of pictures of women wearing hats. Right. You have a whole selection of women with different hats. And it's, a, it's really quite a good collection. Yeah. Uh, but probably you just like, interesting looking faces, whether they're old men with wrinkled faces, which of course we don't have. <laughs> you, uh, you, I don't know. You have these, oh, and little babies. Uh, you have that eye for incredible abil ability to make babies smile and like you. And so you have a lot, and, and just, and the same thing with grown beautiful women. They just somehow- well, I, that's yeah, I avoid possible. setup shots. I don't like a setup shot. I never use uh, I never use a camera on a tripod except for birds, for uh, small birds sometimes. But I always have the camera set on automatic, believe it or not. Rarely do I set it up mm. for a shot because if, it's, if you're setting it up for a shot, you've lost it before you've, you've set up the camera. So I always try to shoot very close people's faces who are unaware that I'm shooting. And if it's if I if I'm a little upset by it, I sometimes go to that person and say, "I just took your picture. Uh, I hope you didn't mind. I took a pic picture of your little girl. I just want to be sure everybody was comfortable." But the best shots for me, uh, as far as portraits are concerned, are people who are unaware that I'm shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, with they might be walking, or they might be looking in a window, or they might be having lunch, or just picking up a cup of coffee. It's something that implies action and tells a story. Everything should tell, every picture should tell a story. Even if you have to conjure up a story, mm -hmm. it should tell a story. Capture a moment. Now, you know, there's a lot of students, I'm not trained, but um, you know, there's all sorts of principles of design. There's principles, principles of photography, like the golden the rule of the golden third, I think it is. Do you, do you have any of that stuff in your head when you're taking a picture like, oh, I should divide this into thirds and I should do this and I make sure that, or do you just, is it just intuitive? Well, more often than not, after I see the photograph that, that's on the uh, computer, I determine how to, how to break it, may, maybe break it in half or in quarters or how to crop it or mm. just simply crop most of it out except maybe just the face or just an animal. But uh, once, once I don't bother 
in my head what I'm going to do with the picture as I'm shooting because I don't have time for that matter. Mm. But once I have it in hand, so to speak, I can decide whether to break it up or, or come in much tighter on just the antlers or the feet even, you know, what if, something different. I might uh, add to Larry that uh, if I'm shooting a person profile, uh, so that let's say they're looking over to the right side of the uh, photograph, I want to leave enough space on the right. Mm. Otherwise, if the nose of the person is right up against the edge of the film, it, it, it wouldn't work. You right. gotta give space. And you, that has to be done with, when you're taking the picture. It's not so easy in post-processing. Yeah. Very often you miss doing that because you're moving so rapidly. But you, but Bill's right. You try to do that because you, you'd like to have some room to to uh, to cut it if, if need be and make, make it a better picture. Um, I, also, you know, I, I'm not alone. No, no, it's hundreds and thousands of wonderful photographers out there, people who have never been discovered, and they they do the same thing I do and the same thing I'm sure you all do. It's just I'm lucky enough to have been able to photograph down through the years and uh, show some of it, even if it's only to myself. Another thing that I would uh, that I learned in my photography uh, is that it's good to shoot for the highlights. Yes, because when you're dealing with digital photography, uh, you will ca capture much more detail uh, if you are uh, shooting for the highlights. You you can subsequently tone down the highlights and and bring up the shadows and and capture a lot more detail. So you have to be aware of what the computer uh, demands and limitations are. Well, photography has changed so completely. I recall the first time I was, I went to um, China back in, oh, I think in the seventies, early seventies with a small group of people on a project I was doing. And I took a hundred rolls of film with me. And that's, just, this is, that's a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of film to take with you to have to lug around. And today you can go and just take it all on, on a little chip, the same thing, and still have room for another thousand pictures. So it, the whole world is, 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 so, is so completely changed. And to keep up with it is it's very difficult, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah. even if you start looking through the, um, begin to look through the photo magazines, you see things, well, my God, I don't do anything. I can't do anything like that. I've never done it. So it begins to pass you by. And let, you think there's a... Yeah, I'm being held held up in your house now. Where, where can you go? I I beg to get out and travel some more. I want. I have family living in Germany. I'd love to get there to, to see them. I can't. All I right. have two great 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 granddaughters there. I want to one, see one of them. One thing you said a little earlier that I'd like to emphasize. Ah, is hi. You, you take a lot of pictures, but when you put together a slideshow, yeah. You don't necessarily pick the best picture, you pick the pictures that tell the story the right. best. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But what you're saying too, because some people just take pictures and they show everything. And after 15 or 20 pictures, you've seen it all. Right. That's why you try to do exactly what you're saying. Yeah. What I'm wondering, you, with, with the advent of, you know, with all this technology you're talking about, I, do you think it, with for up and coming photographers, students, whatever, it, it makes them lazy because they really don't have to worry about exposure. You take a raw picture, a raw format, you can adjust the exposure later. You can adjust the color later. You can adjust the shadows, the highlights. You can crop, you can, I mean, you could make night look like day and day look like night. I mean, is there, do you think there's a, it's it's a healthy, I mean, it's obviously technology is, it makes. Well, let, let, me, let me say this. Recently, a friend of mine who's, a, who's an artist, a painter, I mean, she does the same thing in a way I do, but she does it with a brush. Mm. So I'm doing it merely on film and in, a, in, a different, in a different scope. So I, 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 I don't really think about that anymore. The thing that really gets me is since I've been using a, 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 I use an iPhone so much, I've shot thousands of pictures with an iPhone and some of them are quite remarkable, not because yeah. I'm so good, but because of the equipment. And I, many, many of those photographs have, have appeared in magazines and, uh, and shows. And you would never know whether it was from my iPhone or my very expensive uh, Canon with a, with a 600 millimeter lens. So that's how it's changed too. 
Well, yeah, yeah, and think of some of the greatest photographs ever taken. It was before technology, you know, the war photos, the, the yes. Dust Bowl photos, the New York street photos. I mean, there was no technology. I mean, Ouija and what it was. I mean, technology was just a, a, a lens and a, and a piece of film on the back of a plate. So yeah, it, my father always used to say, it's, it's not the camera, it's the eyes behind the camera. Cause true. Yeah. yeah, absolutely true. And the more you shoot, the more you enjoy it. You don't, you don't just do it to learn how to shoot. You do it because it's a way of, become the sort of a way of life for you. Mm. It's better than uh, washing dishes every night. <laughs> well, yeah, a way of looking at the world. I mean, like you said, you're driving with your wife, you can't help but see That's everything right. as a possible a composition, country. right? I've traveled over my life, I guess, maybe 60 countries over ever since I was a ch child. So the world is a beautiful, big place that today is very sad, but it mm. is a wonderful place if you know where to go. And I miss it terribly. Do we want to and, open up to questions to any, anybody else in the group? Sure, anybody has a question. Yeah, if you'd like to raise your hand, I could call upon you. Just make sure you unmute yourself before you ask mm -hmm. a question. Raise my hand, that's my hand. Bill, did you have a question, Bill Caldwell? Hey, Larry and Bill, you remember we were doing the uh, Wiseman photographic contest every year? And I'm sorry. The, we were doing the Wise Men photograph contest yes. every year. Yes. And uh, I was very interested in getting involved in that. I, I entered many years. Yeah, I've been so, doing it ever since, I think, no. in the last 11 years. I never won anything. I'm sorry? I never won any prizes. I was disappointed. Oh, <laughs> everybody wins prizes. I, when they had the critique, I remember I had taken one photograph was in the Bronx and it was a photograph of Michael the Archangel, Mary on the top of a, of a, uh, a building that somebody had decorated their house. Yeah. You know, one of those row houses. And of course, this is before all the manipulation and all that stuff. Yes. And I took it with a, with a, uh, a sure shot uh, Minolta camera, film, film camera. Right. And I, I had to zoom in on the thing and all that stuff. I took the photograph, it came out spectacular. But mm -hmm. we're doing the critique, the guy's going through the pictures. He gets to my picture and he says, wow, this is a really interesting picture. He says, but you know, as good as the picture is, it's, uh, I think the photographer pushed the color of the sky too hard. It's very blue. Well, uh, well. And, he, and I said, oh, well, that was taken with a film camera, a handheld film camera. So I was up in, in competition with all the digital manipulation of photographs that started to happen at that point in time. And they could not even recognize the fact that this was an actual physically framed by the photographer uh, picture yeah. on film. I quit after that, <laughs> sorry. At least when you were talking I, about that, Biggs was when you carry an iPhone, it isn't very heavy. Huh? <laughs> Makes a big difference. That, that is one of the pictures that won last year with the Wise Men yeah. was uh, the storm coming in on Campo Beach uh, from the Wise Men, and the idea behind it was use what you have for photography, and that mm -hmm. was, I think, one of the why it won. So yeah, one of the most fun that I've had here in Westport shooting it was many, well, not so many years ago, two different times, friends of mine owned planes and I did a lot of aerial photography of Westport. And I thought that was a fun thing to do. And I had never done that before in a moving plane doing and calls, you know, for banking and turning around and going around again and changing lenses. So you get long shots and short shots and wide shots. And it was quite, a, quite an experience. Larry, wasn't that your exhibit in Town Hall? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Photography exhibit? I beg your, your pardon? Your exhibit wasn't in that, Town Hall. Was that your exhibit in Town yes, Hall? Yes, that's mine, yes. yes. That was yes. beautiful. That was well, Thank you. Yeah. I think you took shots of it, different seasons, too. Yeah, well, I'm, I've been true, working now in the last year, but I have, of course I've had to stop. I'm trying to do the four seasons in Connecticut. But I got, well, I have to be careful how I say it. I, I was stopped in my dead because of what all that is going on. We were, a friend of mine and I were driving around 